family, welcome back to another episode. I am so grateful for your presence and I have to start this episode with gratitude because the way in which y'all have shown up for me and shown out the last time that it was just you and I, I was celebrating my birthday. The, the first number start with three. We're not going to worry about the other number after that. But I was celebrating my birthday. I received all of the birthday wishes, all of the birthday love, but y'all took it a step further. You like the podcast, the number of ratings, five star ratings at that on Apple Podcasts has skyrocketed. So truly appreciate that. Seeing that really warmed my heart. And it also um, is a, just a testament that what we're doing here has impact so thank you and i also really appreciate you liking the video if you are watching on youtube that like button hit and subscribe in the comments like just sharing a comment thank you for posting or just like i'm here checking in like it means so much and i have to give a special shout out to tay danny 678 on youtube because last week's episode, I was admittedly a little nervous posting because um, that was an episode from Salon Frequency, which if you've been here since Salon Frequency, you know I've solely been talking to salon professionals. So now I'm putting everything together. I was really nervous how it would be received, but to get a comment like what she shared, it really touched me and it, it gave me Permission I really didn't even know I needed, but I really appreciated having to continue doing the work that we're doing with you. So thank you so much for all of the love. I truly, truly receive it and I am so appreciative of it. As these episodes go, where it's just you and I, we have to start with moments of reflection. And I want to acknowledge the ways in which the universe decides to remind us that just because we know the work, that don't mean we're going to do the work. And if you are going to do it, you're going to have to show up and prove that you're going to do it. So I am hosting, I want to say it's like two days from now, if you're watching this uh, episode live, like premiering it the day, the moment it drops, Thursday at eight. Uh, <laughs> but in a few days, this Saturday, I'm hosting the first lot goes live event of several events that I'll be hosting this year. I'm committed to coming out, being outside, outside, as you say, and hosting events. And truly, I, I really believe as your, as your digital optician and also having been in the industry for a decade, more than a decade at this point, I first started out doing events pause that and it feels like a revival of something really really sacred and really important that human connection that I feel like you know we're I'm missing I can't speak for you but I'm missing being in community with others that are on a positive journey so all that to say we're hosting the lot goes live this Saturday first of several events we're doing this year and you know, this has been on my heart. It's been a desire of mine for a long time. But just like last year, I started to have some of the same same habits. So this event has been posted on Eventbrite since January 2nd. I told myself the first week of the year, you have to get this event up in order for it to be successful. So I got the event up. I put the event up on, on Eventbrite, but I didn't tell a soul. I didn't even tell my mom. I was not sharing it, okay? That was low-key my ego trying to tell me, if you put it out there, they'll register if they're going to come. But if nobody registers, that means they don't want it. That means you're, you, don't, you don't do good events. What you're doing has no impact. These stories I'm telling myself, right? The morning of, I want to, it was, was it this, it was either this week or last week. I think it was maybe late last week. I woke up, I had a dream. I was like, I, I got to cancel this. There's, I got to cancel this before someone registers. 
because it's too close. Like it's too close to the event. I haven't told anyone, no one's registered. Why I, I shouldn't do it. Like it's just maybe, maybe next month or maybe next time. I don't know. We'll see. I, I, I put it out there, but people don't have, people didn't have enough time. Like I started telling myself all these stories, even in my dreams. So I, I, I am thrust out of my dreams, um, about this event. And so I'm like, okay, let me just, let me cancel it. I log on. This is like five in the morning. I log on. Guess what? I open up this event to see a ticket sale and not just any ticket sale, a VIP ticket sale. And I'm like, oh snap. Like we, we in it now. We can't cancel. Now we just got to make sure there's more than just one person there. <laughs> so I'm in go mode, but it, and it was a reminder to me that if you set a desire, set an intention, it will come. You have to do the work, but it will come. It will, it will become a reality. And so as I'm just reflecting and thinking about other things that I've desired or reached for, wanted, and then like stopping for a moment and really seeing, oh my gosh, like they are here. It is here. It doesn't look like how I thought it was going to look like. It's really better. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm filled with gratitude. And I hope that that just reminds you to just to take a minute and reflect about the things that you've been desiring and how they've been showing up in your life, how they they're around you. They're there. It's just a matter of, are you going to open up to receive them? So that's my mirror reflection for today. And if you haven't heard about the lock goals live, I am telling you right now, lock goals, G O A L S lock goals live. Um, if you head to the lock goals live.com, you will see the events and upcoming events there. So, Yes, <laughs> that brought me joy. And if you're watching on uh, YouTube, definitely feel free to share what brought you joy recently. What, what kind of reflection have you had in your life that just made you smile? Or hey, maybe it made you cry, but it was mindful nonetheless. I know that you see the title of this video. The lot community is changing dot 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 for the better question mark. And that's a big question mark. I wish we could emphasize the question marks on titles, but it's, it's some changes and we have to talk about this. Okay. Um, this past Monday, I had the honor and privilege to attend the textured hair summits. Um, it brought together hairstylists, lacticians, braiders, natural hairstylists, from the world, like all of, it was a global summit, brought us all together to vote on, acknowledge, decide on standards for our industry. And this particular, this particular uh, summit conversation is really important and I had to bring it up here. I had to bring it to you because even if you are a salon professional and especially if you are a consumer, you need to understand the state of our industry and where we are, where, thing, where things are. And I didn't understand it at the time because I recorded this podcast episode a few days ago when I went, when I went to edit it. It was no audio. And I was like, why? Why would this happen to me? I, I got to do this all over again. But I, I, I had a smile on my face when it happened because I knew there was a lesson in it. And as, as I'm talking to you now, I'm like, oh, I see. I see why that happened. I see why that had to happen. All right. So I'm going to give you the quick, quick and dirty of it. Um, but it, it's so much more. It's so much more. So if you if you haven't joined my community, definitely make sure you do that. And if you are a salon professional, reach out to me specifically because we have to connect. All right. We have to connect. 
So first I'm going to start with the conversation in the summit was a response to a recent legislation in New York state that says textured hair education must be included in cosmetology curriculum. And you may be asking yourself, don't cosmetologists already learn about textured hair? The answer is no. Sadly, it is not a part of the standard curriculum. Like they have, um, they do have a textbook for it. They do have a textbook for it. The Milady Standard of Natural Hair Care and Braiding it was written, penned by Diane Bailey. Um, they do have a textbook for it. However, this is like a, a add on, right? So if you wanted to get it, if you wanted to look at it, if you wanted to learn it, you could, but it's not standard that is part of the curriculum. And I will also let you know that there is often a separation between a cosmetologist and a braider and maybe even a natural hairstylist slash loctician. And so the argument, well, let me not say argument, the perspective that was on the agenda at this summit was to say, hey, we as a collective stylists, professionals that service natural hair should agree upon a standard and we should agree whether or not we should execute the standard or be at the forefront of the legislation in other states. Cause remember this is just only in New York and other states regarding these standards and there were votes and there were polls. And the short version of it is that there was a lot of conversation or there's a lot of pushback about whether or not these standards need to be outlined and required per state. Now, I'm going to I'm going to stop there because it is it gets really really deep and I want to specifically kind of le lean this perspective of how this applies to locks, being that locks is very much a trend at the moment. But as a consumer, I need you to know that in a lot of states, I want to say it's like 40% of states, cosmetology, the science and art of hair, skin, and nails is not regulated. So that means somebody can wake up today and say, you know what? In my state, even I'm in Maryland, they can wake up and say, I want to be a loctician, roll out of bed, open up a suite, start in, hey, start in our house. I'm going to take clients from whomever, wherever, and I will do your hair without someone saying, yes, you understand. Okay. You have the license, the credentials to operate. So that, that, that exists right now. Where I see this impacting the lock community, I'm just using this word temporarily, community, is in this way, because I heard this separate, this, this distinction between lock culture, lock community, in the lock industry. And when I, when I heard that, I was like, Oh, that makes a lot of sense where we are because you, I, I will not, I'm not gonna put it on you. I am starting to see how trendy locks are becoming, but it wasn't always like that. There was a time when locks carried a very negative stereotype, very, um, aggressive stigma, very dirty look. If you had locks fast forward today, you see them on billboards and ads and, um, you have companies starting to talk about, we have products for locks and things like that. And it all centers around this idea of the separation between the culture, the community and the industry. 
So I would say the, the culture of locks has been here for a really long time. You have cultures like the Rastafarian, Rastafarian culture that believe they don't cut their hair and they let their hair do what it wants to do. They are known for having locks as part of the culture. It has heritage. It has meaning. It has, it's deeper than just the hair strands. That is the culture of locks. You have pioneers. You have people that have come before you to either establish legislation, to perfect the craft and pass it down like a lineage, like a heritage. Like you have, you have someone who has seen for decades how it impacts the, how it impacts people that wear it, what the significance of, what, what the significance of locks is and how they can pass that down. That is a cultural component. But then from the culture, you also have the community. Just having locks invites you into a community. It, it gives you a sense of belonging because there is someone else that looks or shares a similar um, style as you. And so we can build community around that. Now, I may color my hair or you may style your hair. I may use gel. You might use wax. Those are more so tied to your beliefs, but we can still be a community. You, you follow me? So what I see is that we had a culture, was not acknowledged, was not cared for. Nobody wanted to, to, to speak up or be, nobody wanted to have locks. No one wanted to be a part of the lock culture. But then as the community started to grow larger and people started to identify and belong with each other and start to, we almost started to organize. We started to come together. The community grew. And once the community grew, the industry was like, oh, we have a community we can capitalize off of. Now that we have a large enough community, let's start targeting products let's start having conversations let's start marketing to this community to build our industry and with the industry growing the people that are the most vocal have the most influence in that industry oftentimes do not look like us or do not have our best interests in mind. And so it, for me, is a reminder that we can exist together in a community, but your intentions matter whether or not you're essentially for the culture or for the industry, the capitalization of having locks. We're starting to see this with products like there are products never existed really that focused on locked hair. Like it was natural hair and it was to detangle, to make it shiny, which are things that your locks don't need. That, that, that has nothing to do with locked hair. And these same companies are now like, oh, locks are popular? Let's put, okay, let's put natural hair, braids, and locks. Like let's just tack it on there. It don't... We're not changing no formulations. We're not, let's, let's, let's find out more about locks. Let's get more information. They're just like, just tack it on there. There's a community of people that want it. Let's give it to them. And so you, and then let's have a photo shoot. People with locks. Let's put those people on the front of the jar. They'll identify it in the community. They'll see it. They'll buy it. They'll push it. We don't got any, we don't got to do anything. The money just starts rolling in. You also have people that are capitalizing from the services. They're like, oh, locks are trending? The community wants locks? Oh, I'm gonna give them locks. I, I seen that. I seen that on TikTok. I seen that on YouTube. All you gotta do is this. Matter of fact, it's, it's just like braiding. Let's take the edge control, put it in the part, separate it, make it look nice and shiny. And Let's give them locks, okay? Never mind if the locks are not supposed to have edge control. Never mind if we, should, we shouldn't relax the edges, but hey, 
The baddies want the edges slicked. We gotta give them slick edges. So we have to relax their hair with the locks. It's fine. It plays to their insecurities. They need, they believe that their hair should be shiny, their edges should be straight, that they shouldn't have any frizz. We can capitalize off of this industry. Never mind if you're supposed to cleanse the hair. I know with natural hair, you can do a quick five minute wash, the hair is clean. Let's get them locks that five, say five minute shampoo. It's fine. No worries about it. I was having a conversation with a uh, friend in the industry, or shall I say friend in the culture, <laughs> okay? And she is studying to become a trichologist, which is a doctor of the scalp. Specifically, you have a dermatologist, which focuses on the skin all over. A trichologist only focuses on the skin, on the, on the head, which is the scalp. So she's studying to become a trichologist. She was explaining to me, we are already in an epidemic of hair loss within our community, within the black culture. Hair is falling out. Traction alopecia is rat rampant. Just people have hair loss like never before. In her trainings, it is predicted that within the next 10 years, it'll be three times worse, if not more, because of the practices that are taking place today. The lack of standards, the lack of care, the lack of responsibility and understanding when it comes to products, when it comes to internal health, when it comes to people's allergies and the tension that's supplied and the, it, like, it is bad. But as an industry of professionals at that, you want to say that we should not implement standards that the consumer does not deserve or the client does not deserve to receive a service that would do them service versus a injustice. I'm baffled. I've always said we need standards and we need protocols. And at the very minimum, you need to have a consultation with somebody to understand what's going on with their hair because it is not just you. That is, I feel like that is the difference between someone that knows, knows how to, that knows how to do hair, that is like a gift and someone who knows that they're using their gift to serve others. I can, you, I can, I can, I can do hair. I'm not the best. I never claim to be the best, but I can do hair. I started doing my hair, started doing my, uh, hair in my neighborhood, started doing hair, um, for just, you know, people that would ask, but when you position yourself as a stylist, as a salon, as a business, you don't know who's walking through those doors, what type of diseases they may have. Y'all, when I went to cosmetology school, and again, this conversation of going to cosmetology school, um, but you don't want to do straight or Caucasian hair, so you're not going to go, is ludicrous. It's crazy to me because I went to cosmetology school Having already been a natural hairstylist, having already served natural hair, I knew, I knew they wasn't, they wasn't talking about this. Again, I, I knew I went in knowing that they were not talking about this, but what I could appreciate is that in cosmetology school, they're giving you the science behind things. They're walking you through scalp disorders, disinfection, diseases. The stuff that will kill you. When I was in school and I learned that you are risking your life walking into a nail salon. If a person has HIV, it's in their blood, it's a virus in their blood. They're at the nail salon and that technician cuts them, nips their cuticle or something and a drop of blood gets on that tool. They do not clean, sanitize, or clean, disinfect, and sanitize that tool. You walk in and they nip your cuticle. They make you bleed a little bit with that same tool. Guess what you got? Guess what you got? And this might not be as scary for you now, because when I was little growing up, HIV was like 
the end of the world. Now I feel like you, you can live with it, but it's still not something I believe that you want. And HIV is not the only communicable disease that you could you could catch <laughs> people losing toes and foots and just by get, getting their feet done. I think we are now in a space where just like going to the nail salon, just like hopping in a car to drive, sitting in someone's chair is along the same lines as risking your life. And you have to be, we have to have more responsibility over your well being to speak up for yourself, to ask if the person that you are receiving service from is a license. To act, when was the last time they had any continuing education? Because that's the other thing. Get your license in 1995, but you're in a state, like the state I'm in, which it does not implement or require you to advance your education. The practices that we knew from 1980 cannot be the same things that we're implementing in 2024. The products have changed. The environment has changed. People's health has Like, it, there's so many things that have to be updated that we don't even take into consideration. So the lock community, is it changing? Absolutely. Is it for the better? You let me know. And with that, I can't just leave you there, right? Cause as a hair care professional, as someone who cares about you and care about your well being, I have to end our time together with a care, a care kit, something that you can take with you. Because again, have, having a holistic approach, is not just about what I do or what we do in this moment is how you continue to care for yourself when you leave. And so I have two things for you. The first one is a book, the book of the, shall we say week, Black Fortunes, the story of the first six African-Americans who survived slavery and became millionaires. Uh, a client was reading this, recommended it. It is a great book. As we're approaching February Black History Month, which is crazy, cannot believe January is ending so soon. Um, this is a great book because it not only highlights the figures that are prominent and that we know about, like Madam C.J. Walker, it also gets into um, Annie Turnbull Malone, who was here before Madam C.J. Walker and Madam C.J. Walker stood on her, her shoulders. Um, it gives a very insightful perspective of these figures from, I'd say, a pretty unbiased lens that I believe we need to know. So definitely grab you a copy of Black Fortunes. And on the wellness side, I would encourage you to check out the recent um, meditation series that I have started. Um, I want to say it's called abundance meditation. I have linked it in the description box and in the show notes. If you were just listening to the episode, um, I started it yesterday and it just, it reminds me of the connection that I have in that all that, again, like coming full circle, all that I desire can become reality, but I have to stay connected and grounded. And the way things is happening right now, we could use some grounding. So definitely check that out. And if meditation is not within your practice, let me leave you with a gentle affirmation for the day. I lower my expectations of today. I am exactly where I need to be. Take that with you if it resonates. And as always, I am wishing you peace, love, and good vibes.